Hi, I'm Kaylee, a librarian here at Mentor Public Library. And I'm Meg, also a librarian, and welcome to this week's edition of All Booked Up with Kaylee and Meg, where each week we give you different book recommendations on a specific theme. This March, we're going to be looking at Women's History Month. So uh, today's theme, we're going to be looking at books that feature fabulous women, um, true uh, historical figures throughout history that we can enjoy. Yes. And uh, for every book that we talk about today, they are available here at the library. Many of them are also available online with your library card through Hoopla or Libby by Overdrive. So what's your uh, first book? So my first book is a nonfiction title. My first book is called Dead Feminists, Historic Heroines in Living Color by Chandler O'Leary and Jessica Spring. And this is a beautiful, fully illustrated book that covers over 20 amazing women throughout history. Uh, it's separated into these thematic chapters. The authors mix photos and drawings with brief biographical information about each woman. And this book sort of came about in a unique way. It is from two artists who used prominent women from history to make broadsheets, which is a sort of artistic poster with more than meets the eye. So each woman featured in this book has a broadsheet as well as an explanation from the artists of their inspiration for it, as well as what to look for in that broadsheet. So that's kind of a unique feature. Uh, there's several women whose names are super familiar to us throughout this book, like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Harriet Tubman, Marie Curie, but I was more intrigued by some of these women who I didn't know as much about, and it, this is not a full biography of each woman. It's generally a page or two of information as well as photos, so it's just little snippets to give you an idea of who these women were and why they should be remembered. One that I found kind of interesting was Elizabeth Zimmerman, who was a British woman who was taught to knit at a young age. And when she came to the United States, she revolutionized knitting. Uh, she popularized using circular knitting needles and she printed her own knitting patterns and instruction books. And my mom is super crafty, <laughs> quite the knitter and crocheter. So I found it really interesting that this woman had such an impact on an old art, really. Yeah. Yeah. There was one that I had just learned about in another book, so I was excited to see her featured. Babe Didrikson Zaharias, who was an amazing athlete. Uh, she was mentioned in a book my book club just read called Dust Bowl Girls. So mm -hmm. bonus book for you. <laughs> um, but uh, Babe was this all around master athlete. Uh, she competed in the Olympics in track and field. She was, in, she was involved in basketball, tennis, all sorts of sports, but where she really wound up shining was in golf, which she came to sort of late in life since most master golfers learn quite early. Uh, she just had this amazing career and she was named the best woman athlete of the 20th century by the Associated Press. And cool. I don't think enough people know who she is. I think she'd be an amazing role, role model for every athlete, but you know, young women especially. And then the last one that I thought was really interesting was, forgive my pronunciation here because I'm probably going to mess it up, Queen Lily Nokalani, who was the last monarch of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So she is mentioned in here, and she was the only ruling queen Hawaii ever had and the last monarch. She was a writer, a singer, an artist, uh, and she wrote a bunch of songs that are still a huge integral part of the Hawaiian culture, yeah. including some that I think even we would recognize. But she was also famously nonviolent, and when she had been overthrown, she did so with class, <laughs> basically. Yeah. But she also strived to preserve the traditional Hawaiian culture for the rest of her life, yeah. even after had she, she had been dethroned and basically shamed by uh, the overtakers. <laughs> but I thought it was really interesting to learn more about these women that I had never heard of. And for some reason in my brain, I just had not even connected how recent some of this history was. So looking through this was really interesting and it has these beautiful 
artwork throughout. So definitely something to check out. Man, that sounds great. I, every single woman you told me about, I did not know their story. So that was really fascinating. <laughs> and I, the combination of that with the cool artwork, I love it. That's awesome. My next, my book also looks at a group of women um, who kind of trailblaze. Um, it's called Ink and Paint by Mindy Johnson. And this is an in-depth, full-color, coffee table size look at the role women played during Walt Disney Studios' formative and golden years. So there's a really interesting history of women working at Walt Disney Studios. So when the studio began like in the 1920s, all of the prime time jobs, like the, the drawing animators, the story writers, you know, those all went to the men. So the women at that time, aside from like secretarial work, any artistic type of job they would get would always be relegated to the ink and paint department, which their job was to, after the animators had drawn out each picture of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, the woman would in the ink and paint department would mix up all these different inks and hand paint meticulously every celluloid copy of every single print. Wow. So it was a very back, like painstaking, meticulous job and kind of thankless for many years, people didn't realize all of the work that they did in this department. And it shows how even though they were kind of limited in that role for a while, how eventually over the years, and especially World War II, brought about more opportunities for them to expand, women to expand um, opportunities within animation in general. So um, getting jobs in the story department and drawing in general. But then what I really like about it is just looking at the ink and paint department, they would also show how they thrived in that as well and made many innovations that you know lasted for decades in how Disney made their animated movies. Um, you know, as someone who loves animated movies, I love Disney, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is just really fascinating to look at. It's a great book to like sit down with, like on a if you're not on a weekend when you're not doing anything, to look at all the beautiful images, all um. And really what's really fun to me are the little anecdotes of different women employees that they'll give like a little mini biography on them. Mm -hmm. One that I found really kind of amusing was um, Marion Stirrett. She was the first um, female background artist beginning with Pinocchio. And what I found was kind of interesting was she was this trailblazer, like, you know, the first female background artist. And also the, um, she was paid the same as the, her male counterparts. But when she was hired, this was like the studio press write up in 1939 when she was hired. It says, We have another girl, Marion Sturrett, beautiful and a pretty girl figure. She's our only girl background painter. So it was just like this weird mix of like, you know, like, you know, she's doing all these cool things, but yet she still has, like in 1939, like that's how they would write about you when you got this. Mm -hmm good job. So I, I applaud all these women in these books for like what they had to deal with and also for all their achievements that they made. And it's just really a beautifully uh, like constructed book as well. So it's a good that one. sounds really cool. And I really do love that sort of old animation. You yeah. really have to appreciate how time consuming every single step was. Uh, I mean, it's artistry. Yeah. And so I find that really interesting too. Yeah. I'll have to look into that one. My next book is a fiction title. It's historical fiction. And it is called When the Men Were Gone by Marjorie Herrera Lewis. And this is a fiction book based on the events of a real woman. Uh, Tylene Wilson was an assistant principal in 1944, right at the heart of World War II. And she was tasked with finding a new coach for their team their football team. Okay. And this was something that the town and the students really needed because football was like that sense of normalcy for them when so many of their loved ones were fighting in World War II. Yeah. And with just all this chaos, this simple pastime would bring joy to their community. Yeah. Well, Tylene could not find a good coach in large part because all the men were gone, as the title says. But uh, she knew that she could do it. She had the knowledge and she had grown up around it and knew the sport inside and out. But there weren't really female football coaches. Right. Um, 
clad in pearls and white gloves, Tylene <laughs> rose to this occasion. And she took on this task that no one thought a woman would be able to do. She faced adversity from all sides, from the players, from other teachers, from the players' families, from the press even. And it was a bit of national news at the time about this woman football coach. Uh, but she was not afraid to kick off her heels and run alongside the team on the field. And this book is unique because it actually really only covers the lead up to the football season, sort of all of that training and getting their feet under them and everything. And it doesn't really, leaves you kind of hanging as to how did the team do? Um, But maybe what's important here is that she did it, that she took on this task, whether they won or lost, and showed that a woman could do something that other people might not have thought she was capable of doing. And I just, I kind of love stories like this that highlight a real woman who sort of rose to a challenge, whatever it may be, to pave the way for the women who came after her. So it's a nice quick read and it does give you a lot of information about um, Texas at the time, which is where it takes place. Awesome. Yeah, I love it. I love, and I love the, like anything about women athletes, women in sports, you know, I I like sports a lot too. So um, that's awesome. Sounds good. Shout out to any Browns fans because we have, Browns have the first female football NFL coach like in you know the, what I don't even think I knew that so that's cool check that out that sounds like a good one um so yeah so my next one is also historical fiction from kind of the same area you're doing um 1940s but mine takes place in Europe and it's called at the wolf's table by Rosella Pastorino and this is an Italian author it's actually her first book translated from Italian into English came out a couple years ago and it's a chilling look at the women who were made to taste test Hitler's food for him before he tried it. Isn't that not, that's like- Oh my gosh. You know, I, know. I don't even think I realized that was a job. <laughs> I know that is not something you want to put on your resume. Um, so yeah. So though this is historical fiction and the protagonist is not a real person, it is based on a very real group of women. So it begins in Germany, 1943. And our protagonist is 26-year-old Rosa Sauer. Her parents are gone, and her husband, Gregor, is far away fighting on the front lines. So she's kind of impoverished and alone in Berlin. And Berlin is definitely not a safe place to be. So thinking she's like finding a safe haven and going somewhere safe, she goes to live with her in-laws in the German countryside, thinking, okay, maybe this is a little bit safer than Berlin. But that turns out to be kind of the wrong step because while she's in the countryside, um, the SS comes to her in-laws door and tells them that she has been conscripted to be one of Hitler's nine taste testers, a group of nine women who three times a day go to visit Hitler's secretive, um, what's called the wolf slayer. I won't try and say it in German because I don't know German, but (laughs) it's like literally translated into the wolf slayer where three times a day they go there and try his breakfast lunch and dinner and stay there for an hour and as long as none of them die then Hitler is good to eat so that is yeah that is literally something they had to do that kind of blew my mind just realizing that was a thing um also so Hitler's at, food would have been really cold by the time he got to it then yeah come on Hitler <laughs> no how to, yeah not even gonna go there but yeah I know <laughs> but anyway, as the story goes on, there actually begins to, a fraction begins to form among the nine women. And some are like considered the fanatics who are very loyal to Hitler and his cause. And then there's others like Rosa who don't even believe that they're Nazis. They are, Even as they are forced to eat for Hitler, um, they start to believe that they're on the wrong side of history. So it's a kind of interesting dynamic that forms Um, between like a drama between these women who are kind of forced into this horrible situation. Um, So I think it's, it's just to see all the, you know, crap women, you know, go through, this is like one of the darkest things, but, you know, I think it's cool to see how Rosa deals with it, even as she's surrounded by this darkness. So very interesting historical fiction that I did not know before this. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I definitely did not know that story before this. And I think that's sort of something that, you know, we celebrate in Women's History Month, the stories yeah. of women throughout history. So yeah. all sorts of different topics. Right. Well, thank you guys for listening to our Women's History Month edition of All Booked Up. Hope you got some good ideas of something to read and join us a couple weeks from now and we'll have some more great recommendations for you. Yes. Thank you for joining us and happy reading.